Good evening. I'm Anne Flaherty, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to the Irish Cultural Centre's Digital Literary Festival. The centre is based in Hammersmith, London, and for the past 25 years has delivered to its patrons the most diverse Irish cultural and educational programme outside Ireland. The festival comprises a series of interviews featuring some of the most successful authors in contemporary Irish writing. They will be discussing, and some of them will also be reading, from their recent publications. Our guest this evening is multi-award winning writer Emma Donoghue. Emma is from Dublin and has lived in Canada for over 20 years. After graduating from University College Dublin, she lived in Cambridge in England for eight years, so she's very familiar with the immigrant experience. Emma has published works across several genres, historical fiction, short stories, plays and children's books. She was nominated for an Oscar for the screenplay of her best-selling work, Room, and was in fact just about to attend the opening night of a stage version of that book when the lockdown was announced in March. This evening we're going to discuss your latest novel, The Pull of the Stars, which has been described as a story of hope and survival against all odds. And I'll just explain for the benefit of our listeners that the plot takes place across three days in a maternity ward in Dublin at the height of the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. And the story is narrated by central character Julia Power, a nurse who's in charge of looking after pregnant women who are quarantined together because they're suffering with the flu. So I gather, Emma, that the novel was delivered to your publishers only a few days before the COVID-19 lockdown. So in a sense, you've gone through two pandemics. And you know, um, that makes it very um, reassuring for me, living through this one, because whatever happens, I say to myself, well, it's not quite 1918 yet. Um, no, it's, it's pure fluke that in 2018, um, prompted by the centenary of the Spanish flu pandemic, I, I thought it might be interesting to write a novel about it. I was reading an article in The Economist magazine, which is a good example of how one text inspires another. You know, nobody really writes alone. I, I don't even know who to thank because The Economist doesn't do bylines. Um, but anyway, this article it gave me a sense of the kind of weirdly post-apocalyptic atmosphere of the, of the Great Flu of 1918, because it, you know, big, busy, urban cities, people going to war, and yet everything with this spooky atmosphere of, you know, where's the invisible germ coming from that might kill me? Um, it seemed to have killed between four and 6% of the population, which is massive. And it didn't kill the usual age group. It killed young adults, busy young parents. So, so yeah, I, I wrote the novel with no thought of contemporary relevance and um, sold it last year and then uh, delivered my final draft in um, early March this year, thinking, well, okay, I don't have to publish it now until 2021. I'll have a big long break. And the next thing I knew, my publisher said, because of COVID, let's publish it this year. And I honestly hadn't seen any connection until then. I had just, you know, you're so caught up in the world of your writing. I hadn't been paying much attention to the headlines at all. And did you find it eerie watching the COVID-19 pandemic playing out? Did you, did you find parallels, grim parallels, really, in a way, with what you'd just written about? I did. Not just the facts of, of a pandemic, you know, the kind of slow creep, the way you think it's just some other country's problem, you know, and people even try and blame it on the other countries. Calling it the Spanish flu was a, a, an outrageous bit of propaganda, really. Um, it, it, was, it was from Kansas, it seems now. It was no more Spanish than anywhere else. But the, the allied countries in World War I didn't want to admit that any of them had a flu problem, so they called it Spanish because Spain was a neutral country. Um, but, but what I'm saying is that those are the really obvious parallels. But the ones I really noticed were, because my novel focuses on the inner city Dublin slums and Julia's patients are women who are broken down by poverty and bad air and bad water and too many babies. You know, they're ground down before the flu hits them. And she starts to, almost despite herself, see, she starts to draw these connections and to realize how many, how many aspects of um, injustice hurt people long before a random germ does. She starts to, to see the kind of social injustice that lies behind any pandemic. And so I have to say, um, you know, I, I'm reading all the COVID headlines through that lens and I'm seeing so many modern examples of how the people, are, the people who die typically are the ones who we have allowed to be weakened by social factors long before the germs ever came along. Mm. That is true. Now, 1918 was, was a time of, of rapid social and political change in Dublin. And when the book opens, Julia is thinking about two things. Number one is the fact that she's about to turn 30 and she's unmarried. And the second thing she's thinking about is uh, it's the advent of voting rights for women. And as you say, as a nurse, then she's dealing with the effects 
of poverty and malnutrition on the patients. And, uh, and this is all against that backdrop of the power of the Catholic Church, because they're not only running the hospital, but they're running the mother and baby institutions. Um, and, and then they're at the, on the other side of that then is the political fallout between those who supported the 1916 Easter Rising, such as Dr. Lynn, who's a Sinn Féin activist, and Julia's own uh, perspective on that, because her brother has come back uh, from fighting in the First World War, suffering from shell shock. So I was wondering, do you try to be political as a writer? I mean, do you aim to tell a story that invites a reader to investigate all sides of a debate or an issue? The funny thing is that I really tried to keep the politics um, not so much out of the pull of the stars, but I, read, I tried to keep it in the background because so many books set in Ireland's revolutionary period are just entirely dominated by the, you know, Brits versus rebels narrative. So I really tried to keep that in the background. And, and you know, like Julia in the book, I tried to keep my focus like hers on her and her patients. But the politics crept in, you know. I was trying to invent a good um, doctor character and I come across the real Kathleen Lynn who was not only a, a roaming doctor with special in, specialisms in midwifery uh, as well as other medical fields, um, but she was also Sinn Féin's chief medical officer. She was also a suffragette and a labor rights activist. So suddenly she's you know, bursting into my book and insisting on being a character. And there's a moment when Julia says to the doctor, oh, you know, I don't have time for politics. And Dr. Lynn says to her, everything's politics. So mm -hmm. yes, although I, I thought Ireland in 1918 would be an interesting background, that's one reason I set the novel there when it could have been set anywhere. And I was aware that, yes, the, the, the national question would be an interesting background, but I really didn't intend it to come into the foreground. But of course, it, it creeps in because it's relevant to questions about the, the mismanagement of Dublin, say. The Dublin slums were, were considered the worst, um, the worst west of um, India. You know, uh, Dublin was just falling apart. Ireland had so many social problems and it locked up such a high percentage of its people in residential institutions. So, you know, Julia finds that even though she tries to keep focused on her patients, as soon as she starts thinking about her lives, she's asking the big questions like, how should we run this country? Who should run it? And um, how should we change it? Um, I was just wondering if you wanted to read an extract from your book, because there's a, a part where, uh, where in fact, Dr. Lin does make uh, several comments when the two of them are together in uh, carrying out the autopsy. She does make a lot of those points. And I wondered if you'd mind reading that extract for, for us. Sure, sure. Um, yes, um, this is a, a scene where at the end of the first day, Julia's exhausted. You know, she and we have lived through this first incredibly busy shift where she's single-handedly running this uh, tiny little three-bed um, maternity slash flu ward. Um, and so at the end of the day, she's getting to go home to her brother, but no, Dr. Lynn says, come and do an autopsy. And Julia goes along. Dr. Lynn grumbled, so many autopsies being industriously performed all over the world. And just about all we've learned about this strain of flu is that it takes two days to incubate. She cut, she scooped, I labeled, I bagged. Aren't they any closer to a vaccine then? I asked. Dr. Lynn shook her head and her loose braid leapt. No one's even managed to isolate the bacterium on a slide yet, she said. Perhaps the little bugger is too small for us to see and we'll have to wait for the instrument makers to come up with a stronger microscope or possibly it's some new form of microbe altogether. I was bewildered by this and daunted. All rather humbling, she added ruefully. Here we are in the golden age of medicine, making such great strides against rabies, typhoid fever, diphtheria, and a common or garden influenza is beating us hollow. No, you're the ones who matter right now, nurse power. Attentive nurses, I mean. Tender, loving care, that seems to be all that's saving lives. Dr. Lynn peered into Mrs. Noonan's abdominal cavity, which was pulpy with dark juice. She dictated to me, liver swollen, signs of internal bleeding, kidney inflamed, colon ulcerated. I followed her scalpel with my own, taking samples. She murmured, we could always blame the stars. I beg your pardon, doctor? That's what influenza means, she told me. Influenza della stelle, the influence of the stars. Medieval Italians thought the illness proved the heavens were governing their fates, you see, that people were quite literally star-crossed. I pictured that, the celestial bodies trying to fly us like upside down kites or perhaps just yanking on us for their own obscure amusement. Dr. Lynn freed Eta Noonan's small intestine with her scissors now and lifted it in the way of a snake charmer. Autopsy, she said, comes from the Greek word meaning to see with one's own eyes. You and I are lucky nurse power. I frowned in confusion. 
lucky. I said, to be alive and well, you mean? No, to be here in the middle of this, she said. We'll let never learn more or faster. She put down her scalpel now and flexed her fingers as if they were cramped. Then she picked the blade up again and slit Eta Noonan's uterus with delicacy. She said, we all do our bits to increase the sum of knowledge, including Mrs. Noonan. She lifted the flap and peeled back the amniotic sac, added under her breath, even her last little Noonan. I'll leave that there. It's chilling actually to hear it, you know, considering the conversations and uh, that, you know, have been ha held in hospitals for the last several months about, you know, again, this mystery virus. Um, I was just thinking there that uh, Julia herself uh, believes that we have power over our own destiny. She doesn't believe in the pull of the stars, as it were. And uh, she's, I suppose she, she looks to science and logic and she says, um, I would never believe that the future was inscribed to us the day we were born. If anything uh, was written in the stars, it's we who joined the dots and our lives were the writing. And she finds it very difficult to believe that any higher power would allow that the sort of suffering that she witnesses. Would you agree? That she has a crisis of faith almost. Yeah, I'm, I mean, you know, like many religious people, she, she has that struggle with, you know, how can God allow evil? Um, but on the other hand, she finds it sustaining. You know, there are, she's not strikingly religious, but there are moments in the novel where, you know, somebody's bleeding out on, on a bed and Julia's praying at that point, or, or, if a, or if a patient dies. And she's enormously respectful of them. Um, for instance, uh, if she loses a patient, whether a mother or baby or even a fetus, she, she makes a little private scratch on her watch. And it's important for her to, to mark each of these people, if, even if they're nobodies, even if they're, you know, the scum of Dublin, as it were. So I, I really tried, um, you know, even though often she's having to literally, you know, um, you know, treat them like meat at moments when she's, say, doing an autopsy, but she's enormously respectful too. Um, and I, I, I weighed up the different factors that would support Julia. Uh, science is one, and um, I, I believe in the worth of her own work is another. You know, she's, she's a very strong, committed nurse midwife. I really focused her on her job. And, um, and so she, she, she believes in her job. She knows that, you know, even if, for instance, her patients die, they will be with her, she, she'll be there with them. You know, she mm. lost her own mother um, when very small to childbirth and she's just, you know, right there fighting for each of her parents and religion and science um, and, and, and a feeling of the worth of her own work all bear her up. But it, you know, your question Anne, makes me realize um, the characters we choose to focus our historical novels on, they're often not so much anachronistic, but, but there are certain traits we always look for because it simply makes a better story. They're typically a bit ahead of their time. You know, there's a reason why, you know, feisty is a cliche of book covers, especially for historical fiction, because you don't really want to read a novel about, you know, born in medieval times, Emma had no particular ambition and just stayed in her village. You know, we want the ones who will slightly resist the terms of, of their lives and, and rebel to, to some small extent. I mean, Julia from the outside seems completely conformist, but for instance, she does things like she'll bend the hospital rules. She'll tell a patient her first name when they ask, you know, strictly against the rules. I've read a lot about the training of nurses and the emphasis on protocol, punctuality and composure and being ladylike and um, quite emotionally cold. Um, and I, I let Julia deviate from that a bit. So I think we very often in writing novels about the past, we choose a character who's kind of our bridge between then and now. You know, she's a mm. bit more like us, but not anachronistically so. Mm. I thought that was very moving, actually, reading reading the novel with uh, how uh, Julia did her very best to have, you know, to to treat everybody with with dignity. And um, you know, at the cold face of of the pandemic, with very little to offer in by way of, of medication or pain relief, and sometimes all she could do was give them a hot whiskey. Um, I, I found that very moving, actually. Um, and um, um, I, I just wondered there when you talked about uh, writing uh, characters in, 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 in historical fiction, how, how do you get into the heads of characters and their emotional world, um, how they feel and what they think about, and stepping in where the historians leave off and trying to mediate this to, to the reader? Well, you know, I'm always, um, I'm always aware of, of, of what actors talk about as the two ways to get into a character. You know, that sometimes you start with their shoes or their hat. Actors on, uh, sometimes start with the costume and then work back to the psychology. And sometimes they start with the psychology. And, and similarly, of course, the, the circumstances of the time, you know, the fact that I know Julia is, for instance, cycling to work 
you know, with her skirts taped up, but she has to get down halfway and get on the tram because she mustn't drive sweaty. You know, if she was a modern woman, I could have her run to the hospital and then have a quick shower and go on shift, but she has to be ladylike, so she has to stop sweating by the time she gets to the hospital. So that you might call a sort of external. But then for, for her own personal mindset, um, I, 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 I emphasize the psychological factors. Um, and, you know, it's not really that historians leave off. It's more that um, almost everything you need is, is there in the sources. You have to read really widely and not just the obvious things. I mean, I, I may have started, for instance, with, you know, um, letters or diaries from nurses at the time. And often they have a very chipper tone. They're very like, oh, mustn't grumble. You know, two of our number died, but we keep on. And, you know, that, that was part of the mindset of the 1910s is sort of don't complain. Whereas nowadays you'd be all sharing your feelings and seeking mm. out counseling and so on. So you almost have to look past whatever their particular way of expressing themselves was and try and deduce how they really might have felt. Um, mm. But I, I, I would also read things by, say, I remember I read several books by modern doctors like Atul Gawande or here in, here in Canada, um, Brian Goldman, or um, Adam McKay in Britain, talking about his, his experiences in the NHS. So sometimes I would read trans-historical things, you know, to give them some sense of what it might be like um, to be a nurse or a midwife or a doctor and the, the dark humor, for instance, of healthcare workers and, and their feeling of uncertainty and fear about how much risk they're running and what are they bringing home to their loved ones. So I would mm. use contemporary sources and lots of historical sources as well. I would just sort of try and come at the problem from every possible angle, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, I, I would say now that you didn't spare us uh, any details of the painful and mess messy aspects of pregnancy and child birth in the book. And I wondered, first of all, how you researched, I mean, there's a huge amount of research for, uh, that you must have undertaken to, to, um, to, to understand how, how nurses, you know, like Julia Power dealt with this every day. How did you go about the research for this? And also, did you worry that, that the, that level of, in of intensity and description of, of that side of, of uh, pregnancy and childbirth and death and mess and everything. Did you worry that might alienate some readers? I'm thinking male readers, for example. You know, it's alienating some readers, but I'm not sure they're specifically men readers. I, I've seen mm. some women on Twitter saying, oh, couldn't, hate, couldn't really? handle the gore, you know, and perhaps mm. some women responding in a very sort of personal, you know, legs together sort of way, you know, it's a bit triggering perhaps for some women. Um, no, you're absolutely right. But with every book, you lose some readers five pages in. And there's a moment I can hear them go. You know, I, I, when I started writing Room, for instance, because Room was a big seller, everyone thinks, oh, it was an obvious hit. But no, it's a weird premise. Quite a sicko premise, really, a child born into a kidnap situation. And my, my decision to write it entirely in the voice of a five-year-old meant that after a few pages, I could just sense many people going, oh, you know what, I can't bear to be here in the head of a five-year-old. This is too irritating. Um, so that's not a moment when you should lose courage and try and persuade those readers to come back because they'll be coming back in an unenthusiastic spirit. You just have to wave them off and say, and say oh, well, they might like my next book. But in a way, what I, I think one, th one strength I do have as a writer, I'm not, I'm not some exceptional stylist or inventor, but I think I have a very good instinct for knowing what each book is trying to be, for sort of, you know, the way Michelangelo used to say he could sort of glimpse the figure inside the block. And it may not be a book that you want to read, um, and it may not be a book that will sell, but I, I very early on get a very strong gut instinct of, oh, I know the kind of book that should be, and I know what it needs stylistically, and it won't be like my other books necessarily. And this one had to be absolutely committed and explicit about the details of the body, because it's all about a woman whose job it is to read the body and to pay close attention to all those tiny little details. I mean, Juliet literally sniffs her patients. You know, after birth, she's always watching out for the first hint of, of um, septic fever, childbirth fever that would often get them on, on the um, start on three or four days after the birth. So she literally has a little sniff of them. It's a very visceral book. It's all about the senses. So there was no point um, trying to pull my punches there. So mm. um, yeah, that would be an example of how you just have to Go, go the way the book wants to go and don't worry at all if you lose to some readers. You know. mm. <laughs> don't take it personally. Sorry. I think on the other hand that there, there are also some readers who would enter into the drama. There's a lot of drama taking place in that small room. And I know, I mean, I personally felt I was laboring with some of those women. You know, you're, what, you're willing them on. You want, you, know, you want everything to be all right. Um, and so I, I found it very engrossing, actually, uh, even though, you know, there was a lot of detail. I, I was absolutely amazed, really, at how 
uh, these nurses coped with, um, with, with with so little, you know, and and also of what yeah. I felt. No, so you're absolutely right. If I if I reined in, I wouldn't have made the childbirth scenes exciting enough. Uh, so mm. I might have ended up with something which was halfway and, and lukewarm and please nobody. Um, and I, I tried to almost give the novel the rhythm of labor. You know, I, I remember a midwife saying to me once, you know, what makes labor bearable is that the contractions, um, they're like waves, they're not constant, it's not some constant level. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, here it comes, and then a little rest. And they always say to you, you know, take your rest, you know, relax as much as possible in between the contractions. And similarly with the reader, I have very grueling scenes where everything's happening at once. And then I've got little calm moments when everyone has a cup of tea, you know, or there's a little bit of humor right. or something. So it's not actually absolutely unrelenting. Um, but yeah, I, I tried to give it that rhythm. And, you know, I like books that ask a lot of you emotionally. I don't like books that are so confusing to read. You don't know who's talking. But, but I, I do like the ones that make you feel a lot. You know? mm. Mm. What sort of response have you had from, from readers about this, given the, the fact that, you know, there's been the pandemic? What sort of things have people said to you about it? Has it made them feel, you know, better or worse, shall we say? Oddly enough, I think it's made them feel better. I mean, those who have chosen to engage with reading a novel about the great flu pandemic during this one, you know, some readers are like, oh, can't face it. Um, but, but those who have read it feel oddly cheered by that feeling of, you know, the human race has been through worse before. Um, it's been read by a lot of healthcare workers. I, I seem to be getting either tweets or, or emails from nurses um, almost daily. It's marvelous to me that, 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 that they have the time and the headspace and the, and the wish to read about this. So I'm, I'm thrilled that they're responding so strongly to it. Um, or, you know, I, I think a, a vaccine specialist wrote to me to say, oh, I'm so glad you're emphasizing science and vaccines and how important it is in this time. Um, so, so they're the ones I'm hearing most from. But, you know, it's never predictable what people will think. And, the, you know, the books had some incredibly zealous reviews from men. So it's, what I like is that because of the pandemic, the pull of the stars is not being read as just a kind of, oh, yeah, women's history, no big deal. You know, it, it has taken on a certain urgency. And at mm. first I was a bit uncomfortable that my publishers wanted to bring it out this summer because I thought it seems kind of indecent to be trying to sell anything during COVID. But actually it feels like it, the novel has, has had the chance to take part in an international conversation about, say, healthcare workers or the, the social constituents of healthcare um, um, injustice and the way social change can happen so quickly at a time of, of chaos and fear. Um, so, so it's been a great experience publishing it this year. Mm. Can I ask how you spent your own time in lockdown? Did you find it a, a creative time? Or did you find it an isolating time? How, how did you cope? Well, it, it started with a, a strong blow in that the uh, North American production of Room, the stage play, uh, was cancelled on opening night. So you know, it's quite good to start uh, the lockdown with, you know, the worst blow, because after a couple of days, I was like, well, nothing else is really bothering me about this. You know, yes, I miss my friends. I I, you know, I had to cancel a trip to see my sister and my dad in America, um, but nothing else was as sad as the room production being cancelled. Um, so I, I generally, I would say it's been quite a pleasant lockdown in that a writer's life is very home-based anyway. Um, so I've got plenty of writing done. I've been a bit distracted. Maybe I've worked on a few projects at once um, and there's been a bit more daytime television than ever before, but um, whatever gets you through, you know? Mm -hmm. So no, I, I can't complain. And above all, I've enjoyed the company of my partner and, and our teenage kids. You know, I think it's been a real test of family, this lockdown. Yes, can you yes. bear the people that you're locked up with? And I can. Are they, heading back to school now? are they heading back to school soon? Yes, yes. Our kids are heading back to school in a week. Yeah, and I'm nervous, but I wouldn't dream of stopping them. You know, I think they're des desperate for a few faces that aren't ours. Mm. What was the atmosphere like in the area that you live in? Do you live in, in a suburban area or do you live in the city? You live in, in the other London. <laughs> yes, I live in London, Ontario, which is about a third of a million people. So it's smallish and North American cities are often quite spacious. So compared with friends in, say, Bristol in England, um, who, who said they couldn't go out without being within one feet of their elderly neighbours, you know, they felt they had to, say, drive just to go somewhere they could walk. Whereas our streets are very spacious and open and also... Canada's policies have been sensible enough. We have not had, I mean, we've had a terrible surge of COVID in our long-term care homes, for instance, but generally our rates have been low and there's a lot of trust in the public authorities. So I don't feel society has been breaking down. So it's nothing like the chaos to the south of us in America. 
Um, mm. So, so no, it hasn't been particularly frightening, and there's been an awful lot of goodwill and you know neighbors helping each other out, um, a little neighborhood caremongering groups as they call them, and um, you know people growing little herb gardens for others to take, that kind of thing. So it's been a time of great goodwill, and it's been very exciting to see things like the, the Black Lives Matter protests taking on such momentum here. You know, it's as if everyone had a bit more time to actually think about things than before. Mm. And did you get a chance to catch up on reading? What were the books that sustained you? Well, I always read a lot, but um, but yeah, books have helped in lockdown, definitely. Um, luckily, when it happened first, I was I was already reading Hilary. Mantel's um, The Mirror and the Light, the end of her uh, Thomas Cromwell trilogy. And I just wanted that to last forever. You know, that's a good example of how, you know, reading about a time of, of, of terrors and dangers and plagues and executions and tortures, oddly comforting when you think we've got through all that before. Um, mm. Another novel I really loved was Maggie O'Farrell's Hamnet. I was totally cynical when they sent it to me because I was like, oh, it's it's got a Shakespeare hook, you know, oh, it's about Shakespeare's children. You know, I hate things that seem to kind of um, you know, profit from a link to a previous book or, or a celebrity. But then I read it and I was completely won over. It's an absolutely beautiful book, um, which just happens to be about Shakespeare's children. So those are two I really loved. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, books and, and good television, I have to say, uh, were hugely helpful. I mean, uh, for instance, a beautiful series, a HBO series, Chernobyl, you know, that was about an absolutely horrifying disaster. And yet it really celebrates the scientists who were the only ones who kept speaking up and telling the truth. You know, mm -hmm. I felt it's funny, my background is arts, but I quite often include science in my in my novels. And this year I'm feeling very fervently pro-science. It seems so important to keep speaking up for science at a time of such craziness when you see these, you know, these, these marches in the streets that are, you know, you know, promoting conspiracy theories about, about vaccines and so on. And, and I'm thinking, you know, didn't we all do science in school? You know, are there not certain things we can agree on, but apparently not. Mm. All your books are very different, aren't they? I mean, you, you've, you've written right across all the genres, different stories, different styles, films, screenplays, short stories, literary history. And do, do you, what do you feel that you're in the mood for writing next? Do you know, I'm trying to write a musical, would you believe? The book, the libretto of a musical. Um, uh, you know, a breakthrough experience for me, I've always tried to write quite a few things, but mm. I remember when I was writing the film of Room, I did feel for the first time, I'm a complete idiot, I don't know what I'm doing. And it's a very intimidating form to try and get into screenplay writing. It's got an awful lot of glamour and mystique and traditionally been done by expert men in Los Angeles. So um, I felt like a complete newbie and that was such a great experience. And I learned so much from, from the Irish company I worked with, Element and Lenny Abrahamson in particular. Um, so almost immediately afterwards, I thought I'll try writing books for children. Again, I felt completely you know, inexperienced and blundering, um, but it was, it was such an enjoyable experience. So I, I like being in that zone of what am I doing? You know, the improvisational zone. And it keeps you, keeps you lively, you know, because when you've been writing as long as I have, um, almost 30 years now. So you must not get satisfied with yourself. You know, there's no way you, sh you, you should sit, sit around and say, oh, I'm a splendid writer. That's the way to write some really bad books. So mm. similarly, writing a musical, I have slight alarm bells going off in the back of my head saying, what do you think you're doing? What are you playing at now? Um, so so that's, that's very helpful, you know? So that's your next project. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. And I've got some fiction, fiction on the go as well. I, I will always have fiction on the go, especially as the... Um, the other, the more collaborative arts, um, for me, there's always a certain uncertainty about, for instance, if it's film or TV, um, you know, which of them will actually get made. So many film or TV projects don't because it's so expensive or, you know, external circumstances like, you know, the shutting down of theaters can make productions grind to a halt. So fiction really feels like, you know, the rope I hold onto and it's the form over which I have most control because I get to pick all the words. Um, so, so yeah, that'll always be my, my kind of, my daily bread. Um, mm. But I have to say the collaborative forms um, are very exciting to me too, because, you know, such sparks are struck between minds when you're working with other people. And there's something about performance that just thrills me. Mm. I was just thinking there when you talked about room and adapting it for the stage, I was just wondering if, if you would consider that the pull of the stars might be suitable on, for a stage production as well. Yeah, I'd be very open to it being staged and there has been interest in, in filming it as well. And you know, when I think people often think that a novelist, um, if, if offered the opportunity to put her novel on the screen or on the stage, is just trying to grimly, you know, um, keep it exactly as it was, like cage it. 
But really, it's something you should only say yes to, I mean, in terms of being involved with the adaptation, if you have a genuine enthusiasm for seeing it change, because after all, the book is the book. So if, if I was to make it into a film, the whole point would be to make it different, not necessarily different in plot, but different in execution, different in language, you know, because a film is told through light and through faces. So a lot of those words you've written just fall away because you don't need them anymore. So yeah, I find adaptation a thrilling process. Um, and with, um, with, uh, room, for instance, because I got to do it for film and for stage, it was almost like a, a study project for me on, on what is so good about a film and what is so good about a play. You know, each mm. of them has completely different um, powers and challenges, and it, it produces three different texts, and it's a fascinating exercise to me. Mm. Mm. Well, as you're the youngest of a large Irish family yourself, and your father was um, an academic and a critic, and uh, I, I believe I read somewhere that your mother uh, uh, was a great diary writer. She kept uh, writing diaries for years and years of everyday events, and you found them. And I wondered if you'd uh, grown up in a house of books, or were you the only person in your family to enter the literary world? It was a house of books, um, but that didn't make all of us literary. You know, environment mm. and even genetics only go so far. Uh, we all developed in very different directions. But mm. I would say some of the family are keen readers and some are very eloquent. I mean, my brother, Dave, um, has been an Irish diplomat and through speech writing and, you know, brokering careful negotiations of wording of laws, you know, at the UN, I think he's probably, his words have probably changed the world more than mine have. He was involved in the um, development of the millennial goals, for instance, and sometimes I think his words will actually save lives in a way mine never will. But um, yeah, I'm the only one who took to literature. Um, my mum, it's funny, she'd laugh if she, if she heard herself described as a great diary keeper and that to her these were just little little jottings in her agenda because she was absent-minded. I mean, like myself, I need to write in, you know, cut toenails, <laughs> forget, day after day. So, um, you know, my mum's diaries would say things like, go for haircut and then you'd see a slash through it and she'd have written at the end of the day, rained all day, didn't go. So, so they were just sort of, um, you know, a daily agenda with jottings, but the jottings become very eloquent when they're showing traces of this family of 10 people, you know, eight kids and herself and Dennis. Um, and, and they're often, you know, very interesting and evocative little traces of emotion, but always in a sort of telegraphic style. And of course, I can't make out half her handwriting either. So I have to read them in a very sort of Zen way. Like I let my eyes go down this terrible scribbly writing. And if certain words or phrases jump out of me, I think, oh, there's a bit I understand. There's a message from Francis, you know. Um, mm. But she, no, she handed, she had, she, she, she waved at the, the set of books at one point and said, oh, feel free to use all them after my death, you know, so I feel I have her blessing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm basically working through them and, and, and writing out the bits I can read and the bits I find interesting just as a family history project. Um, and it's, it's fascinating when you see, say, a new technology like the dummy who's get their first television, that kind of thing. <laughs> Do you think that you might have, uh, in reading them, that you might have absorbed um, some of them and, and, and either subconsciously or consciously inserted those day to day uh, aspects of life into any of your books? Well, it's funny, I think what I, I, I think I probably get as much from my mother as my father in that, um, you know, Dennis is, is a superb critic and he's writing still, he's, he's working on a book about Henry James right now at the age of 90. Um, but my mum, uh, Frances, has such a passionate interest in social history, you know, like the details of her own life and history and everybody else's as well, you know, she was a great storyteller and you know, she would, um, she'd suddenly stop the car and pull over and say, here's a famine graveyard. Or if we went to a stately home, she'd take me around the kitchens. So I think probably a lot of my interest in sort of the lives of, of, the, of the ordinary people who didn't quite make it into the official history books, a lot of that comes directly from her. Yes. Do you think that perhaps if times have been different, that she might have been a writer herself? I'm just thinking that there, you know, I remember talking to Count Tobin once and he talked about his mother and feeling almost guilty that he had actually become the writer because he felt that his mother had, would have once had aspirations to write herself. It's very possible. Yeah, Frances, um, she, she got as far as an MA in English and then she added in later years, you know, tucking them in between the childbearing, she added um, masters in film and in, um, I think she did one in social studies as well. And she, she self-published a beautiful memoir of her childhood. Yeah, so she was very eloquent. Um, so I, I certainly absorbed all that. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, for her, like, like with many people, um, you know, if, if you just carry on having children, that does take up quite a lot of your life. But she always had extra energy. You know, she'd go off and do a course in something like civil defense or, you know, fashion journalism. Um, she just had she just had brains and energy to burn. And um, 
you know, she, I don't think she ever regretted having the eight of us, but we certainly were, you know, ended up being the main focus of her life. But mm. um, she, yeah, as a conversationalist, she always remained really lively. So yes, it's possible she would have been a writer. Yeah. But, you know, not everybody likes the writing life. You know, I happen to think it's the only possible way to live, but not everybody would. That's not something I'd recommend either to a school leaver. You know, I wouldn't say, oh, write novels. That's going to work for you. I sometimes can't believe my luck that I've been able to live off this, you know. What do you think you might have been if, if, if things hadn't worked out in terms of, of being a writer? Did you I have can never think, I can never think of a backup plan. There were unrealistic dreams like I wanted to be a ballerina, first thing. Um, I would probably have been an academic um, in that, I, you know, I did a PhD and I like academic research and I've, I've done some independent research. Um, I suspect I might have been a rather bitter academic. I would have been those ones who's always wanting to be writing her novel instead of sitting around waiting for for um, office hours, you know, <laughs> I hope not. But, you know, I see my partner's a, an academic and she's so kind to her students and she gives so much to the teaching. And I think I might have been a bit impatient and bitter. So um, probably just as well, that didn't happen. Hmm. I was wondering if, if you had a chance to read any of the current crop of, of, of younger Irish writers. Many of them are, of course, young, young Irish women are having a, having a great success at the moment. And I'm sure you uh, know that the big lockdown obsession was Sally Rooney's Normal People. I don't know if you managed to catch that on television. I did, yeah. No, Lenny, Lenny sent me a link to it early. It was thrilling. Yeah, and it, I, what amazing timing, you know, it was just when people wanted a really absorbing story about human connection. You know, those moments of touch suddenly took on a new preciousness, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, people like Misha Dolan and um, Kevin Power is not particularly young, but he'd be an example of, the, of how lively the Irish short story is. Um, and then to see many of our older writers going strong as well. I, I got to do an event with Buddy Doyle recently. Um, it's funny, it's the kind of thing that if, if the events all had to be live, I wouldn't have had that chance, um, live and in person, I mean. But because it was virtual, they said to me, who would you like to be in conversation with? And I was like, any chance I could get Roddy? So virtual events have this um, strange ability to unite readers who are writers who are on different continents and bring them to readers who are all over the world. So, you know, I don't think they're anyone's top choice um, compared with in-person events, but they do have certain advantages, yeah. But to get back to your point, I think Irish literature is in a particularly lively state, yeah. And it's, it's just fascinating to see. And I think it probably comes from the fact that Irish culture has changed so rapidly over the last 30 years. I mean, for an emigrant, it's just fascinating. It's as if every time I go home, there's some totally new social phenomenon and I really have to keep in touch not just by reading, but by, you know, long, long chats with, with friends there too and visiting family. Mm. I was wondering if, if, you know, if, if you were, if you, if things had been different, might you have stayed in Ireland? Did you feel the kind of desire to escape? Did you f find it limiting or claustrophobic when you were, you know, when you were growing up? Did you feel? I'm you really had... liking your what if questions. These are wonderfully probing questions. And um, I think I probably would have gone back because yes, I did feel it stifling at first. But if I think of that moment, I'm thinking of the mid eighties. I remember the Kerry Baby scandal and I remember the, um, the moving statues. That was a crunch point for me. I was a teenage girl in Dublin and I'm you know, reading, you know, um, I don't know, Emily Dickinson, that kind of thing. And then, you know, to read about people kneeling at the foot of statues and convinced that they were moving. I just felt mortified and embarrassed by my country. I was like, what kind of medieval Catholic hellhole am I, am I um, trapped in? And the, the two different referendums we had on the, the, the equal right of the unborn, um, I just felt, get me out of here. So um, when, I, when I left in uh, 1990, there certainly was a feeling of like, must escape, you know, especially because I knew I was a lesbian that didn't feel like there was any room in Irish culture for me. But that feeling certainly calmed down because not only did I become more of a, an adult and a grown up, but um, Irish culture changed so quickly. I remember, for instance, in 1993, um, so just three years after I left, I was back in Dublin and they had just decriminalized homosexuality and I was on a pride march and I was thinking, okay, there's more air to breathe here. And um, similarly with other, with other legal changes and cultural changes over the years. So I think if, if I had done my PhD in England, I probably would have, like many people, come back to Ireland, especially when things were economically a bit better. You know, I don't think I would have, you know, exiled myself from the place for life. I wasn't in that sort of James Joyce point of view of like, must get out of the place forever. Um, I think, you know, like people like um, 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 Joe O'Connor, you know, I, I would have emigrated, but then gone back. Um, but I just happened to fall in love with a Canadian, you know, and uh, sometimes the random 
the random wind blow you to, to uh, another continent. So I've ended up in Canada. But I never regret emigrating because I think it's enormously good for a writer. It um, defamiliarizes your environment to you. It makes you a bit of an outsider to your home culture and to the new culture you're in. And I think that can only be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Is that from the point of view of perspective, do you think? Yeah, because it's literally hard to describe a place well, especially to outsiders, if you're so entirely within it. Um, I think the best writers will manage to to, as it were, see the strangeness of their society, even if they don't leave it. So it's not like you have to be an immigrant, but immigration is a very, it's a shortcut to seeing how arbitrary our social rules are. So I would say most of my books either have immigration in them or immigration is an analogy for something going on in them. Um, for instance, in Room, you know, Jack and his mother stepping out into the outside world, that's really an immigrant story. Um, finding yourself, you know, always a bit of a blunderer, slightly misreading the situations. Um, emigrants will, will notice tiny little turns of phrase that the locals won't. So I'm very interested in kind of linguistic play that way. Um, so, and even since then, since moving to Canada, I've had other experiences that again make me feel new um, in that we've gone to live in France several times now because my, my partner's um, from France and uh, our kids are bilingual. So quite often we go stay in France and I instantly feel like a royal fool, you know, because my French is not good at all. And I'm, you know, noticing all sorts of little things linguistically and I'm, I'm made to feel like a beginner. And like I was saying about writing in different genres, I find that very um, fruitful. Um, so, so yeah, immigration has been just what I needed to kind of, you know, wake me up as a writer. Hmm. What are the things that you miss about Ireland? And, and, and I think you're probably out of Ireland as long, you know, you're probably in Canada now as long as you were in Ireland as, you know, growing up. But are there things that you miss about the place? Yes, very much. And I don't think it's some ossified vision of Ireland, because really what I miss is, is the experience of being there, which I get regularly. I mean, when there isn't a pandemic on, I'm home at least three times a year. And I work with Irish people on film and TV projects, um, as well as having good friends there and, um, and family. So I would say Ireland is really rich in conversation. Um, I, would, I, I would say standards are very high for lively conversations. Sometimes, you know, savagely mocking conversation. I, sometimes my non-Irish friends will hear me talking to Irish friends and they'll think we're having an argument. And I'm like, no, it's slagging. Or, or they will wonder the fact that we talk and, and listen simultaneously. You know, mm -hmm. so there's, a, there's an energy level to Irish conversation and not just in the pub, but anywhere. Uh, which I find really precious. Um, but I suppose, you know, every cultural uh, trait has its dark side too. I mean, I, I might say by contrast, Canadians can be a bit more cautious in their conversation when they first know you, but that's partly because they're being so polite and respectful, they don't want to uh, say anything crass. Whereas the Irish are probably rather more willing to risk saying something crass, you know? So each, each country has its advantages. <laughs> Very polite people. That's what they're known for, that's for sure. What about, um, you know, the advantages of, of, of Canada? What are the things that you like about living there and the whole cultural world there? How do, you, how do you fit into that, do you think? Do you see yourself as fitting into that? Yeah, I saw myself as Canadian as soon as I arrived because the definition is wonderfully loosey-goosey. Um, I mean, Canadian, you know, comedians sometimes mock Canadians for this, that, that we don't quite know what we are. But in fact, what that means is that we are very committed to multiculturalism. I don't mean there's no racism. There certainly is. But generally, Canada has a sense of itself as being, you know, made up of, of many people. We've got a high percentage of immigrants. Um, even, even, you know, all the white people are often, you know, the children or grandchildren of immigrants. Um, ties to all sorts of U European countries. So there'll be a strong kind of Ukrainian contingent or Finnish contingent or the Irish or the Scots. Um, and then in, say, in BC, there'll be a huge number of Asian immigrants. So Canada sees itself as a sort of multi-flavor country and it doesn't have this sort of, um, sort of almost stern central identity. So again, it, it, it counts you as a Canadian author the minute you arrive. Um, and so, so I've, I, I have felt able to be both for a long time. And, you know, because I had eight years in Britain as well, I, I feel very comfortably part of, part of that world too. And Canada's so close to America and most of my sales are in America. So I, you know, I'm happy setting a book and I've set a couple of books in America too. So really I would say the British Isles and North America are kind of a one big, um, you know, free trade zone for me, for me, mentally speaking. Um, mm. So, so yeah, I've, I've been very happy here. And, and Canada, I, I find extremely progressive. You know, we have an actual charter of human rights and freedoms, for instance. 
And so in a way, when I was in Ireland, I was always aware of, you know, you're a lesbian, you're a minority, you know, you're stigmatized. And in Canada, I've literally been able to forget that for a lot of my working life, which has freed up a lot of my energies for other things. You know, I, I never wanted to be a full rights agitator, you know, activist. And so in Canada, I felt able to really write about whatever I wanted and, and um, just get on with my life and, and get on with having kids as well in a, in a situation where nobody was looking, looking askance at us. Mm. And talking about your kids, you, uh, you have uh, Finn and Una, am I right? Yeah, they're 16 and 13 now, yeah. And, and Thank God they're old enough to have entertained themselves through the pandemic, you know. Those who have small kids had a totally different experience and that was not one I wanted. No. Mm, absolutely. I was just wondering about their, you know, how you, uh, how you manage their sort of, uh, their Irish background, you know, their connections with Ireland. Uh, do, do, they, do they like to go over? Have they got cousins? You know, how do they sort of, how, does that, how do you embrace all that? Yeah, I would say we have brought them at least every summer. Um, this was the only summer we haven't brought them there. So mm. they're very consciously Irish and they have lots of cousins and, and friends of ours too, they're very close to. For instance, there's a cottage in, in the wilds of West Cork where we've been to several summers in a row and we were meant to go there this summer. And I would say, you know, I, I, I dragged them to standing stones and dolmens and so forth. So, you know, they might not be able to list many Irish historical facts, but they are passionate lovers of Tato crisps, for instance. Um, you know, so it's a place of pleasure for them. I think we, we, we eat a lot of Irish junk food there. So we go mad for the sausages and the brown bread and so on. And um, we've spent enough time there that they're enormously comfortable there and, and proud of it as one of their sort of source countries. I mean, through Chris, they're, they're French and they're English as well. So they have this kind of, you know, set of European affiliations. So, so when the World Cup is on, for instance, they can cheer for whoever seems to have some chance of winning, you know. Mm -hmm. So like many Canadians, they have, yeah, they have, they have a mixture of loyalties. And um, I'm really glad, for instance, that they knew my mom really well before she died. They were very, very fond of her. Um, so I suppose Ireland is, is, a, is a set of very concrete, warm associations for them. You know? Um, I was just wondering what you might be doing if you weren't doing this now, if you weren't doing our Zoom meeting, would you be on a book tour somewhere or what would you be up to? Well, my book tour has been entirely virtual, so it's all events like this one, um, dozens of them, and I've got dozens more to go. And um, I would be just back at work. I'd be having my afternoon coffee and, and trying to write the next scene in my musical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's funny, I don't have very strict rules for myself about how much to write or exactly what I write on. So, so yeah, I'm just always writing the next thing. And because I have quite a lot of different projects, again, it makes it less stressful because instead of worrying over, you know, why have I not heard anything back about one film or other, I can just get on with writing the next thing. All the central characters in The Pull of the Stars are women, not just uh, Julia and Dr. Lynn, but there's also uh, the character of Bridie who comes to help Julia at the hospital. Can we talk a little bit about Bridie? I suppose for Julia, Bridie was a, 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 a way into a world that she had no experience of. She comes from a, a, a mother and baby institution and has, has suffered extreme deprivation and cruelty all her life. Uh, can you t talk a little bit about the character and why she was so important in the book? Sure. Um, with The Pull of the Stars, I really began with their jobs, right? So I, I began with Julia and I was trying to put her in a situation where she would suddenly have to run the show instead of just being a very obedient, you know, cog in the machine. So I thought if the hospital is so understaffed, she could literally find herself in charge of this small ward. But then I thought, okay, she literally can't change the bedding without help. So she needs a helper. And I thought if I bring in a volunteer helper, completely untrained and low status and unpaid, that would help show the kind of web of healthcare workers, you know, no, Healthcare, we often talk about heroes as if they're individuals, but in fact, it's, they form a sort of crucial net, you know? Um, and so as well as showing the surgeons and nurses, I really wanted to show the, you know, the, 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 the lowest order in the hospital, but who are equally crucial to saving the lives. And then I thought how interesting it would be if, if Bridie is, um, if she's coming into this situation with, it would, it would appear nothing but deprivation. She has every reason to be grudging and angry, right? She comes from what she calls the pipe, right? Orphanages um, and industrial schools. And I wanted, I think because when babies are born in my novel, you know, some of them have a perfectly cozy life ahead of them and some are faced with the absolute uncertainty of being thrown into the kind of, you know, adoption system. And so I wanted somebody to speak for that world. And I thought how interesting it would be if, if Bridie comes from that world, but in fact has such natural gifts of energy, curiosity, intelligence, 
Um, Bridie was partly inspired by volunteers during the flu pandemic who described with an absolute thrill how important it was for them to feel needed for the first time in their lives, to feel really, really useful. Um, so, um, yeah, so she, she comes in and she knows nothing. And so the reader gets to learn with her, you know, she understands nothing at all. She makes classic mistakes, like she, she boils a thermometer and it breaks, that kind of thing. Um, but she has natural gifts with people. So I suppose I was, I was um, sort of weighing up the different factors in, in healthcare of there's, there's knowledge and experience, but then there's also sheer energy and goodwill and the wish to learn. Um, mm. But it's the only character I've ever based on a government report in that I read the, um, the Ryan report on Irish residential institutions uh, cover to cover. Um, and I chose all sorts of tiny little details from that report. I mean, not, not the cruelest ones at all by any means, but just tiny little details like, you know, a girl who said she was punished for having red hair or curly hair, you know, um, hung up by her bun. And I thought, yeah. oh, okay, Bridie's going to be hung up by her bun, you know. So it's, it's always those tiny little details you're looking out for in the sources, you know. And I suppose then the character grew out of the research and that I said to myself, what kind of person could be, you know, hung up by her bun for having red, red curly hair, but still have, a, still have wit, still have energy and still have so much to give. Mm, yeah, she's got incredible empathy for, for all the others in the in the war, doesn't she? And um, you know, she's definitely a, definitely a, a you know a very special character, really. Um, okay, well that's excellent. I think that's brilliant, Emma. I think we've gone through everything. Great questions, I have to say. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I suppose I'm just going to say a, um, a thank you. Okay, so finally, I want to thank you, Emma, for joining us for our Digital Literary Festival and hope one day we can welcome you to London, to the other London. And anybody who wants to purchase The Pull of the Stars can find it in all good bookshops. It's published by Picador in hardback or by following the link to our website at the Irish Cultural Centre in Hammersmith. Thank you, Emma. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>